NBC5 News at 6. First at 6, an NBC5 News exclusive. A teenager sits behind bars for the brutal rape of a pregnant college student while his mother grieves at home wondering what really happened. Good evening, I'm Allison Rosati. And I'm Rob Stafford. NBC5 investigates a teenager accused of sexually assaulting a student at Chicago State. Tonight, his mother sat down only with us, and she has a message for the victim and the prosecutors. NBC5 investigates Phil Rogers is in our newsroom live with details. Phil? Allison, it caused a lot of raised eyebrows in court when prosecutors admitted the star suspect in this case was free on electronic monitoring when he allegedly assaulted a 24-year-old woman. Today, when we started asking questions, nobody in the court system wanted to talk about the apparent lapse in county security. The attack was especially brutal. A young victim four months pregnant was assaulted here in the 9800 block of South Indiana. He comes up behind her with a knife, put the knife to her neck. Robert Perkins is the victim's father. Done. Sexually assaulted her, then forced her in a trunk. The suspect, Aaron Parks, is just 17 years old. Today, his mother, who asked that we not show her face on camera, blamed drugs for her son's downfall. He was a good kid. He went to school. And last year is when I started noticing that he was sick. Last Wednesday, at the time of the assault, Parks was free on electronic monitoring for another attack, an alleged July assault on another woman who was carjacked at gunpoint. In that case, he was charged as a juvenile with aggravated kidnapping, vehicular invasion, unlawful restraint, and aggravated assault. But he was allowed to go free, as long as he remained in his mother's home in the 600 block of East 100th Street. When he leaves, they should pick that up because he's no longer in my home, and that's where his monitor he's supposed to be at. And it didn't, it didn't happen. There are many unanswered questions. The order granting his freedom stated that while Parks was to wear a monitoring transmitter 24 hours a day, he was allowed to leave home to attend school for medical attention or religious classes. His mother said she thought he had left home to register for GED classes at Olive Harvey College, one and a half miles away. In reality, he was allegedly at the attack site a mile away in the opposite direction. Why no alarm bells were set off with those who were supposed to be watching him isn't clear tonight. I'm sorry for the family that had to go through this with this girl because she didn't deserve it. Now, did someone drop the ball? We can't say. We do know a formal report was prepared today by the juvenile court and forwarded to the office of Chief Judge Timothy Evans. That report was in their hands at about one o'clock this afternoon, but Evans' spokeswoman wouldn't discuss the case, saying only, quote, I hope to have something tomorrow. Live in the newsroom, Phil Rogers, NBC5 News. And Phil, obviously we're going to stay on this. Thanks. Good evening, I'm Allison Rosati. I'm Rob Stafford. Tonight at NBC5 investigates exclusive. How could a suspect with an electronic monitor be free to strike again? Tonight, astonishing details of a violent attack allegedly committed by a 17-year-old boy in an exclusive interview with a young woman he's accused of kidnapping. NBC5's Phil Rogers joins us now from our newsroom tonight with her terrifying story. Phil? Allison, tonight in the face of our repeated inquiries, Cook County authorities have finally admitted that their home monitoring system failed allowing an assault suspect who they were supposed to be watching to allegedly leave his home undetected and attack someone else. The officer assigned to that suspect has been suspended and authorities are now reviewing the entire program. It was a crime which shocked all of Chicago. A 24 year old college student, four months pregnant, sexually assaulted and locked in the trunk of her own car. That was almost me. This woman, Gwendolyn Davis, says the same suspect, 17-year-old Aaron Parks, carjacked her and forced her to drive at gunpoint two months ago, here near the corner of 73rd and Ada. I tried to give him my keys, my phone, everything. He didn't want nothing. He wanted me. Davis says she escaped by ramming a police squad car. But after he was charged with that crime, Parks was allowed to go home on electronic monitoring, which was supposed to be tracking his whereabouts when police say he attacked the Chicago State student last Wednesday. How did it fail? How did they not know that he was not where he was supposed to be? That's Robert Perkins, the CSU student's father. He told us today he thinks he is owed an explanation why someone who authorities were supposed to be watching is now charged with such a brutal attack on his daughter. Yes, I would like to know how did 
this gets so far where you don't know where someone is that has electronic band on their leg. Yesterday, we spoke with Park's mother who asked that we not show her face. She told us that last Wednesday was not the first time her son left home undetected. If they tracking these kids, they should have known when he was leaving out the house. They should have been able to pick that up. Someone dropped the ball because there are so many people on home monitoring system now. Do they know where they are now? Late this afternoon, Rose Golden, the director of juvenile probation and court services, sent us this email admitting that procedures were not followed in Parks case. The officer responsible for watching Parks has been suspended and the department is initiating a full audit to determine if this was an isolated case or if they have a bigger problem. Live in the newsroom, Phil Rogers, NBC. NBC5 investigates new information on a story we brought to you exclusively. A home monitoring system failure that allowed a teenage assault suspect to allegedly leave his home and attack a pregnant Chicago college student. NBC5 investigates Phil Rogers is in our newsroom tonight with what he's learned about the home monitoring system, who's watching, and when. Phil? Allison, all day today we've been asking how exactly the electronic monitoring of juvenile offenders in Cook County is supposed to work. No one would respond, but the written statements of the chief of that program seem to suggest that at times no one is watching in real time where young offenders really are. As we reported yesterday, Cook County authorities now admit that their electronic monitoring system failed in the case of 17 year old Aaron Parks. At a time when county authorities were supposedly keeping an eye on Parks through an electronic ankle bracelet, they now say he was able to leave home undetected, allowing him to allegedly kidnap and brutally rape Robert Perkins' daughter last Wednesday. So someone was assigned to him, but was negligent in watching over him. The director of the county's juvenile probation and court services, Rose Golden, told us in an email she suspended the officer responsible for watching parks and has asked for a full review of the system. But even when that system is functioning correctly, it appears authorities aren't actually watching offenders in real time, meaning someone can wander off and officers have to essentially notice that they're gone. The electronic monitoring software logs individual movements that EM officers review at the beginning of each shift before the officers proceed to other tasks, Golden said. The compliance of offenders in the program is periodically verified throughout the course of each officer's shift as part of their duties. In Park's case, his mother told us he had already left home by the time she woke up last Wednesday, and authorities say he assaulted the CSU student at 1220 in the afternoon. After the fact, investigators said they tracked his electronic ankle bracelet to within 20 feet of the crime scene. But there is no suggestion that anyone knew he was missing prior to that. This wouldn't have never happened. Or if the courts were doing what they were supposed to do, he would have never been let out of jail. Cook County authorities say they have the capability to monitor the movements of about 300 accused juvenile offenders. As of yesterday, 262 were in the system. Live in the newsroom, Phil Rogers, NBC5. Tonight, NBC5 investigates gets results. It comes after one of our exclusive reports on a terrible crime. A man free on home monitoring accused of raping a pregnant college student. On Monday, we revealed how the home monitoring system broke down and that a probation officer was suspended. Tonight, we have learned the county will change the monitoring system. NBC5's Phil Rogers has been on this story. He has exclusive details tonight. Phil? Allison, there's been a firestorm of controversy since our first reports on this issue earlier this week. Now we've learned that the home monitoring program isn't even a 24 hour system to begin with. Charges or rather changes are promised starting as early as tomorrow, but not everyone is on board. First, the way the system works now. The electronic monitoring and juvenile probation is not a 24 hour monitoring system. You heard right. When juvenile offenders, even violent ones, are released on electronic monitoring in Cook County, the system is only staffed from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. on weekdays, 2 to 10 p.m. on Saturdays, and 10 to 6 on Sundays, meaning for long periods every day. 
as possible that no one is checking on these kids. County authorities suspended the officer responsible for watching 17-year-old Aaron Parks, the suspect in the brutal rape of a Chicago State University student last Wednesday. But Union Chief Jason Smith said today it is the system, not the officer, which is to blame. I believe that they're using this officer as a scapegoat. Tonight, Rose Golden, the chief of the program, tells NBC5 that as a result of the Parks incident, starting as early as tomorrow, the county's vendors, Sentinel Offender Services, will begin monitoring juvenile offenders 24 hours a day. But the juvenile probation officers say they have the know-how, that they should be doing the 24-hour monitoring, and that if the county wants to make changes... So that's going to have to be discussed with the union, because that's our work. Tonight, the union is calling for an outside investigation of the entire juvenile probation system. They say the public is at risk and that the Parks incident should never have happened. If there was some set standards in place and the proper protocol was inputted, then these officers would have been able to monitor this kid correctly. By the way, Sentinel is not in Chicago. They're out of Irvine, California. Golden said they will monitor off-site, and she told us it still hasn't been determined how they will notify officers that their young charges might have wandered away. And the union challenge? That's fine, she said. I'll deal with the fallout later. Robin Allison. Phil, thank you. NBC5 investigates, gets results. Tonight, a major change in the way Cook County monitors juvenile offenders. This following our exclusive reports on a system failure that allowed a Chicago teen on home monitoring to allegedly attack a sex and sexually assault a pregnant college student. NBC5 investigates Phil Rogers has been on this story. He brought us continued developments. He joins us right now with some new information. Phil? Allison, the county says yes, finally, 24-hour monitoring of young offenders released back into the community is becoming a reality. But as you're about to see, not everyone is greeting the news. For years, the Cook County Juvenile Monitoring Program has not even been a 24-hour system. For nine hours on weekdays and 16 hours both Saturdays and Sundays, no one has been on duty to watch as many as 300 juveniles on home monitoring. Some of them, like 17-year-old Aaron Parks, charged with violent offenses. It's possible that no one is checking on these kids. The county says they will be now, albeit from halfway across America in Irvine, California. Starting today, the county's vendor, Sentinel Offender Services, will be monitoring 24 hours a day, offering email alerts anytime a monitored offender strays beyond where he or she is supposed to be. Union Chief Jason Smith complains that function should stay with his officers, that already they are undermanned, can't make arrests, carry weapons, or even handcuffs, and under increasing pressure to keep kids on monitoring and out of the juvenile detention center. So these officers have actually been discouraged from fouling or bringing these minors back in court out of fear that these minors may increase the population in the juvenile de temporary detention center. And the complaints are nothing new. This 2000 memo obtained by NBC5 asked that probation officers be allowed to carry handcuffs and only for nonviolent offenders to be placed on home monitoring. Warning, we cannot guarantee that a minor will not be able to resume his delinquent behavior and put the public at risk. It was 14 years ago. Even with 24-hour monitoring, many contend there need to be tighter controls on exactly who is allowed back on the street in the first place. You have juveniles here committing violent crimes that should have never been out. Sentinel already had the contract for home monitoring here in Cook County, paying them about $3.6 million. As of midweek, there were 262 juveniles on home monitoring here in Cook County.